Hi, this is wait, Tara wait, Reed. Wait, I'm your wait, host. Wait. Now. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host. This is Tara Reed, and I have a very special guest. This is a special edition of the Politics of Survival. I have award-winning Canadian journalist Ava Bartlett live from Ukraine. Ava, thank you so much for coming to the show. Good morning, Tara. Good, yes, it's early. You got up early for me. Thank you. It's well, I, I get up early anyway, but yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So everyone stateside and in Europe is worried about you because um, apparently the Ukrainian military decided to, there's a website that puts you on a kill list and um, it's horrendous. And there's other journalists on this list. And I was wondering if you could just start out talking a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, it's a list that was formed uh, many years ago, I think in 2014, in 2014 I believe it was, um, and it's effectively um, a hit list for any dissenting voice, and there are thousands of names on it, um, and I would stress and emphasize that, uh, you know, we should also very much be concerned for Ukrainians themselves, because in the democracy that is Ukraine, uh, if you are a dissenting voice of any sort, or not even not even a dissenting voice, but if you are somebody who has shown any sort of uh, support uh, towards the Donbass republics, even as innocuous as a taxi driver uh, taking uh, a pensioner from um, uh, the Donetsk People's Republic to wherever they go in Ukraine to get their pension, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. end up on this list. So wow. you will have your, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. I mean, it's crazy enough that a journalist, because journalists should not be targeted for doing their profession. No, no, journalism is journalist not a crime. Yeah. But, but there have been Ukrainian uh, opposition members put on the list and uh, there and, and civilians as well. And so on this list, they'll put your name, they'll put any de detail they can get, uh, including like your home address, your telephone number, et cetera. And people have uh, died after being put on the list. So, you know, we could say it's a coincidence, but I highly doubt that. You were actually, um, you know, it's it's not been in the mainstream news. And in fact, um, <clears throat> as you know, you saw a video clip that I, that I did um, because I was oh, very concerned you. about it. And um, and then you saw other people, you know, trying to individually just lift up the, the fact that this was happening. But the only media I saw in Indy, um, who's with us, who's uh, producing and engineering right now from INN. Indy, could you put up the the, the picture of, of, uh, of that, the slide? Um, is RT International was the only um, media company that I've seen, at least, um, that has dealt with the kill list. Um, and did yeah, you have so, that? Uh, so uh, what I can say to that is, um, well, Tara, you, you are aware of the NBC, um, uh, uh, we'll put in parentheses journalist, uh, who smeared not only myself, but uh, it was, a, a, it was mm -hmm. 12 people in her smear, um, yes. including Patrick Lancaster, who's lived in, right. uh, in, in the Donetsk People's Republic for like since, I don't know, I think he's lived here since 2014 maybe before, maybe slightly after, but point being, he's lived here a number of years. And he's done some uh, incredibly courageous reporting uh, from on the ground, uh, putting himself at risk. And, right. you know, she she had the audacity to basically say his reports are contrived, that the people that he's shown, unfortunately, you know, in in this this type of area, not, not in this type of reporting, you will be showing dead bodies, you know? Uh, right, and right, right. She had the audacity to to say effectively that the the reports he showed, including their bodies, were staged. So it's disgusting. That she, is from her office, her comfortable office, wherever she's based, uh, and and him uh, sweating and 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 putting his life at risk, reporting, you know, to show the truth about what these people here, where I am now. Uh, have been enduring for eight years, you know, uh, eight years of yeah. killing by Ukraine. 14,000 14, Russian nationals murdered, um, you know, by neo-Nazi brigades. Um, uh, Indy, do you have I, that? I, do, you, do you, I'm sorry, do you have that? Um, okay. Thank you, the, the article. Could you, okay, good. Um, no, I can't see the NBC article. We can't see, it doesn't show us on our side. I can't see, sorry. Uh, I, I might have a screenshot on my phone. Yeah, there we go, here it is. Russian propaganda efforts. That's okay, that's okay, that's okay. 
Russian propaganda efforts aided by pro Kremlin content creators research finds. So you were talking about this NBC hit, and I made the point yeah. publicly that no Western media covered that a journalist that holds an American passport and a Canadian passport is on a Ukrainian kill list and not NBC, not CBS, not CNN, not any of the um, Great Britain stations like BBC have talked about this, but rather right. a couple of days ago, NBC did a hit piece with you in it featuring you and other fine investigative journalists simply because, you know, they're not doing the State Department, you know, talking mm-hmm. points, which is yeah. apparently if you're not doing NATO talking points or the U.S. talking points, it's like you don't exist or or worse, they attack you. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Well, I mean, true. Uh, yeah, this is something I've I've experienced since I would say late 2016 uh, for mm-hmm. for my reporting from Syria because again what I was reporting from Syria did not jive with the official narrative which was frankly bullshit pardon my language but it was no, it was propaganda coming from the West and it was it did not match with reality which I was seeing on the ground when Aleppo was liberated in late 2016. Western media said Aleppo fell and I had just left Aleppo and I was in New York City giving some lectures and I I saw on TV and I was like, are you crazy? Like Aleppo has been liberated from Al Qaeda. This is supposed to be America's enemy. And you're saying Aleppo fell because now women like you and me can walk in the streets freely. I mean, it's ridiculous. But uh, I, I just want to make one more point, uh, Tara, is um, just prior to the NBC uh, smear, CBC, which is Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, so Canadian state-funded media, we have to make that point because, you know, they always make the point about Russian state-funded media, um, reached out to me uh, and, and tried to get me to come on to their uh, program, which, you know, I, I don't give them the time of day because they don't deserve my time, frankly. I'm mm-hmm. happy to talk with any honest voice, no matter how large or small their audience. But right. these right. these these uh, unscrupulous uh, prostitutes don't deserve our time. I would extend that to anybody, including your, yourself. But uh, CBC reached out to me, and they um, here's the interesting thing: they reached out to me to say we want to do an interview with you um, about the that the fact that you partic- participated in a um, tribunal on Ukraine's war crimes. The interesting thing is the only way that they could have known about that is if they had seen the the, um, um, kill list entry on me, which specified that. Now, the the entry on Ah. me was actually created a few years ago, but they've updated it since. um, Mm -hmm. And they updated it to include that I participated as a journalist in this tribunal in Moscow uh, in uh, like a a month or so ago in April, I think. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I just gave my observations of what I'd seen uh, from here in the Donbass. Mm -hmm. And so the only way the CBC hack could have known was that he saw the entry on the kill list because I did not publicize this on my um, social media. I I didn't have a link at the time or whatever. Um, And uh, so he, in his email to me, did not express concern about the fact that I, a Canadian, a fellow colleague, was on a kill list. Instead, he wanted me to talk about, he wanted to entrap me into talking about my participation in this tribunal. And you know how that would have gone. Uh, he would have very yes. picked a soundbite, said this uh, Russian regime apologist, blah, 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 but not at all talked about the fact that I could be wiped out because I'm on this Yeah, or disappeared. Indy, yeah. do you have that? Tw- you have that tweet, I believe. I pulled it. Um, if you could put it up for us on the screen. CBC. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so for my audience, this is, this is what she was talking about. So instead of actually discussing (laughs) the fact that a journalist is on a kill list, they want to do a hit piece on her um, and and entrap her. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's so frustrating and um, that we have so many I, I won't even call them journalists. They're stenographers right. for, for the empire, okay. right? Because they're not doing the work. You're doing the work. Um, you know, Ma- Max Blumenthal, the gray zone um, is doing the work. And then you've got uh, Wyatt Reed doing the work and all of them get labeled as Russian state affiliated media when they're actually on the ground and trying to get the truth. It's, it's frustrating. Um, yeah. So, but, you know, I have, I have to say uh, that, uh, I don't know what the CBC has produced. Um, they Their timeline was kind of vague. They didn't give me a deadline like Brandy of NBC. Um, right. But uh, for, as for as for Brandy and NBC, 
uh, as you know well, like her uh, attempt to smear flopped massively, as they always do, actually. I would say that my colleagues would agree that whenever, and, and yourself, you've experienced the smears. I would say that yep. whenever the smears happen, uh, you find more support than ever uh, because people are like, uh, you know, inquisitive minds. Basically, well, I, I feel like those who uh, go along with the smear have already made up their yeah. mind and they're, they're either yeah. extremely brainwashed or they're, they're part of the problem. But then there are other people that maybe just never came across the person that issued the subject. And they're like, oh, well, that's interesting. I'll look at that. And oh, well, actually, this person that you're smearing makes a lot of sense. So, uh, you know, thanks, NBC, for the publicity. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it backfired massively. And the yeah. other point I would make about that smear is that, and I did so on Twitter, is that, you know, this is 2022. And Brandy seems to still think that the White Helmets are a valiant rescue operation when we all know that they're a propaganda construct massively funded by the West that works exclusively with terrorists in Syria. So she, you know, outed herself as either supremely stupid or supremely complicit or both by endorsing the White Helmets narrative in 2022. Well, I like the way, and I, I'm not sure, was it you or someone else I saw that highlighted that her only past writing experience was about luxury bathrooms or something maybe that was on your claim you know um, you know um that was i i did say that but that was actually about a prior smear but it's it's, ah, it's prior it's smear. Very, yeah but it, it's it's right. essentially it's a, the same kind of personality because yeah. to my knowledge i mean i think you've looked at um brandy's writings and right. uh i did and i didn't see any about ukraine or donbass i didn't no. see any prior knowledge of this area so why why that the the bathroom journalist i wrote about i mentioned is relevant is that uh, some years ago uh the guardian um got this woman olivia salon who's based in california i think mm -hmm. uh to write a um a piece a story as she called it on vanessa Beely, my, my my colleague and good friend and myself and she sent us also an email um, full of incriminating questions uh, also asking how we qualify as journalists etc um and when i looked into her she'd never she didn't know anything about syria her experience was writing about fashion and shoes and toilets in la you know so that's why i was like yeah. this is the quality they're dredging up but that's what they do. They they hire they not hire they they bring these people. It doesn't matter if they have any sort of knowledge about the the subject matter, and then they these people um, send these incredibly offensive uh, emails at us, demanding our at attention and participation. But the mm -hmm. thing is, they don't realize you know we're not that dumb and <laughs> we're not that naive. We've been through this before, and like they don't, as I said before, deserve our time. So I, I think like, I know a lot of people would say like, we'll just go on, maybe they'll give you time, but no, they won't. They'll never give you a fair shot. Their aim is not to be a news uh, source. Their aim is to manipulate your thoughts and to manipulate your perception of a particular event into their very narrow, um, you know, uh, preconceived uh, idea, which is of course aligned with uh, the, the warmongers. You know, it's, it's not like they're this individual journalist's thoughts. And that's another difference. Like you yeah. are an independent journalist. I'm an independent journalist. And when I go to a place like here, I have ideas about things I want to write about, but I don't have a script written because I need to talk to people and then I need to see what they want to tell me. And then that's when I start deciding how to write things. But they come, they well, if they deign to come here, they'd already have the script written. And they'd just be right. looking. They have to, they have to go within those parameters Absolutely. and not outside. Right. Because of what they're paid to do. And it wouldn't get past their editors, even if they tried probably. No, no. Um, Tara, if I, if I may, I'm sorry, but if I may, go ahead. Um, in 2017, I was giving a lecture in Montreal and two Canadian uh, prostitutes came to that lecture only uh, to get their soundbite and smear me, which they did. Uh, but anyway, after that, um, this wonderful Canadian journalist, Junid Khan, came up to me and said, hey, Eva, you know, I was in Iraq when the U.S. invaded. And, mm -hmm. you know, back then he was saying, like, you know, we didn't have like Internet wasn't a thing there or a thing in general. And mm -hmm. uh, he, he made a really like a lot of effort to get his article back to his Canadian uh, La Presse. Uh, editor, um, Agnes Gruda, the, the woman who wrote the hit piece on me. And he said she she demolished it from like a 1400 word uh, article to like three, 400 words, completely changed the tone from what he had honestly written about Iraqis not welcoming the invasion to the opposite. 
So wow. like, here's a guy that was actually working with an establishment uh, media. And they, like you said, their, his words could not get past them. And by the right. way, this woman took issue with the fact that I, I, I wear, generally don't have it now, um, I'm not sure where it is, um, a bracelet of the sovereign flag of Syria, because I recognize Syria's sovereignty and Syria is very dear to me. Uh, but anyway, she, she took issue with that and said no respectable or credible journalist would ever wear that. So when I went on her Facebook, wow. I found her in Libya holding a terrorist rifle, you know? Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Jihadi Agnes. So, you know, what really struck me in the interview that you gave with RT is that you um, just said you're going right back to Donbass and I'm really, you know, and so here you are, you're live, in, you know, from Ukraine yeah. in this moment. Um, you've just arrived, I assume, a few days ago because I just saw you a few days ago on the on RT International. What, um, how are you feeling and, and what was that first day out like for you? Yeah, so I arrived, uh, what day is today? Today's Sunday. I arrived uh, late afternoon Friday, so you know not much you can do that day. But yesterday mm -hmm. I went out with a fellow journalist from RT, Roman Kasarov. He's by the way he's an excellent journalist. He's been here for most of the eight years, uh, and mm -hmm. he's really a courageous, very empathetic, um, humane journalist. And I, I would really encourage people to look up his reports. But we went. I'm, I'm just going to look at my phone so I don't mispronounce the area. Well, I don't want to say the exact area because if I do, you know, I, I worry right, that yeah. you know yeah. repercussions. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but first, we went yeah. to an area southwest of Donetsk, and it was. Uh, it's hard to estimate on the map. It was between one and three kilometers from Ukrainian forces, and the reason we went there is that he had heard there were um, around 50 or 60 elderly people uh, that had no means of survival that were essentially starving. So he wanted to bring humanitarian aid to them. Um, and so it was, um, part of the route was quite risky because we were exposed to potential uh, Ukrainian fire, uh, mortar fire or whatever. Um, uh, and we arrived at a monastery in the area and there were people taking shelter at that monastery, both people that actually lived at the monastery and, and people from the local uh, region. And when we arrived, the shelling did start. Um, mm. And so we stayed there. We were there for a couple of hours talking with the people, but also mm. waiting for the shelling to stop so that we could go on and find the elderly people and deliver their humanitarian aid. Uh, but in the end, we actually had to leave the aid with the people at the monastery so that they would uh, deliver it later uh, because uh, basically we learned that there was a Ukrainian drone and they had spotted us. So, oh, wow. um, you know, it was stupid and foolhardy to try to continue on with that uh so i mean that that was my day yesterday uh thankfully nobody was hurt but there was that risk and, and as you know like rt crews have come under fire uh in recent yeah. weeks well, not just yeah. recently anytime yeah two weeks ago there was an rt um and then some routers um i think someone got killed on routers um um indy do you have um the uh photos that ava posted um from yesterday <laughs> great so i want to do that Oh. So, so for the audience, I'm, I'm, I'm asking our, our producer to put up the, the photos that Ava was talking about. How are you feeling as far as like, like, I mean, this, the, the spirits of the people that you were talking to, what could you describe a little bit of what they're going through and how they're dealing with it emotionally? And here, um, he's posted up your, your tweet there. So people of the audience can see. Um, it, it's much like, it, it's much like. Uh, I lived for three years in Gaza and, you know, the situation there is uh, unimaginable. It's much like yeah. uh, people in places like Gaza or Syria or, or I don't know Yemen, but I have, I have to imagine it would be the same. Places that have been bombarded for years and years to the silence of the media, you know, people are just getting by. Everything is normal. People don't flinch when they hear the bombs. I don't flinch when they hear the bombs, you know, but people that live there, like, they're just they're doing the motions of living, you know, but, uh, it's, um, that, you know, there's no sugar coating it. They're, they're existing. So is and, there, is there infrastructure still in some of those areas, like for um, running water, electricity, obviously like where you are right now, there's internet or capability of, of some electricity, uh, but is that is, is fresh water and food you were mentioning they were having trouble getting food. Is that an issue? 
right yeah, now? Yeah, it is an issue. It is an issue in those areas. I mean, this again, this was right on the front line with the Ukrainian forces. So right. uh, I don't know how I asked Roman, like, how are these people surviving? He said they're starving. Mm -hmm. um, I have to imagine that. Um, I mean, there is goodwill amongst the communities. So I have to ma imagine that other people in the region are helping them. Uh, because I, I don't know. And, and you know, in 2019, when I came here and I went to Gorlevka, which is north of here, which I, I do hope to go back to and is being pounded. Uh, right. I, I was speaking with a couple of friends yesterday. Um, and I, I, when I went to those areas uh, um, on, on the front lines with Ukrainian forces, uh, it was mainly elderly. And I have no idea how they're surviving. And it, it broke my heart speaking with them because, they, you know, they're like, you can just imagine they're like your, your grandmother or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, and they had nowhere to go. They could not flee, even if they wanted to. And uh, I don't like they're existing. I don't, I really don't know how they're existing. Um, here in, uh, sorry, in Donetsk, uh, there's electricity, of course, but there are water cuts. Um, so mm -hmm. for like eight hours, nine hours a day, the water's off. It's manageable. Oh, wow. people, people just fill up uh, buckets of water or bathtubs if they can. And, 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 you know, just wait until the time when the water is flowing again. Um, actually, the place I was at yesterday, some man asked me if I had a, a, a power bank. Um, so I went in my mm -hmm. bag and I got the power bank. And then he said, can I keep it? And I'm like, okay. You know, yeah. like, yeah, they're you replaceable. Do, do. They're replaceable for us. But yeah. in, in that situation, no. I mean, that could yeah. be the yeah. whole community is using it. I don't know. Oh, wow. Um, well, Ava, you're, you're doing amazing work. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I, I'm hesitating to ask you future plans because again, I want your safety first. Um, and <laughs> that is the most prominent thing right now. So before I, I get into the next kind of thing, I wanted to, to ask you, um, Indy, is there some comments or questions in the chat that you wanted to, uh, highlight for Ava? Well, everybody is just showing a lot of love. Uh, they're saying even normies are catching on. Everything they've been calling Russian propaganda for the last six years has turned out to be true. Um, yeah. <laughs> Jenny Lynn says, can you imagine having that kind of audacity, no matter how bad you want that career? Can you imagine gaslighting a real journalist in a war zone? You'd have to be a real sociopath. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Thank all you. Right. Uh, we've got Absolutely. radical leftist agenda in the house and big mad crab who does all of the thumbnails. And I wanted to give him a shout out and say hi to he big did the mad artwork. Crab. Yeah, Greg. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. For tonight. Uh, again, Gira Brown saying so many of those, so many sociopaths in government and media in this business. Uh, that's a lot of it. Again, this is a really good interview conversation. If Jackson was on live, would you would you Jackson people be here live? Ha ha ha. Yeah, except we know they would anyway, because we all love Jackson and Tara and everyone, and we're all doing the work here. Uh, and of course, okay, Jackson, I wish Jackson would ask Eva to be on, okay? But we'll we'll talk about that another time. And again, how does a journalist so, stay away from danger in this type of scenario is what Big Mad Crab is asking. No, they you don't. <laughs> you, you don't stay away from it. You just you're, you're aware of the fact that you could be shelled or, I mean, look, um, in my time in Gaza, I never wore body armor. I, I never experienced that until I came to here, uh, in 2019. So in Gaza, you know, like we were under F-16 bombs, we were under drones. I was being fired at by Israeli, uh, live ammunition and you just get used to wow. it. That, yeah, it, that, that, that is the extreme. Uh, mm -hmm. I've learned but to me, it became normal, unfortunately, yeah. uh, became normal that the fact that you just at any point could be drone bombed or <laughs> F-16 or shot. But, uh, here, I mean, you, you, mm -hmm. you wear the body armor and like, for example, when we were driving to this village yesterday to try to meet the elderly people, uh, Roman's just like, okay, now this stretch of road is exposed to Ukrainian fire, you know, like, you know what to do. He was like, uh, you know, when they start firing, you know, get out of the car, drop to the ground, don't go into the fields because they're mined, you know, that kind of thing. Like, so there's knowledge you, 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 you kind of like, uh, ex acquire as, as you go along, like street knowledge, I guess, <laughs> and things to do or not to do. I just also want yeah, to mention, it's, it's, it's tough. sorry, Pascal oh, says ahead, here, Eva, thank you so much for your courage and dedication to showing the truth on the front, lots of respect and admiration. And of course we, we want to definitely show show respect and 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 admiration what you're doing out there and and to give us the real story and to counter the narrative again i just uh, i also want to say thank you myself and i'll i'll turn off the mic so everybody else can doesn't have to hear me <laughs> <laughs> thank you 
So, so Ava, I have a question about, um, you just came, um, you were uh, previously um, in Moscow and um, I think a lot of Americans are cut off now. They've, they've censored RT and in, um, in England, um, they pulled their license arbitrarily. Um, with, and, you know, as you know, um, an R RT journalist, Brian McDonald was sanctioned. So he's Irish and he, now that means he can't travel in the EU and all his assets were seized simply because he worked for RT. Yeah. Um, could you tell me some thoughts about that and how, what it's like for day-to-day, -day, um, Russians right now with all this vitriol coming from the West, from NATO countries, from their governments, not from the common people, but from the governments, the ruling class and from the West, you know, the American ruling class. Yeah. It's like for me as a, I, I moved to Russia one year ago um, and I had visited Russia uh, for a couple of months in 2019. So I'm still quite new to Russia, but for me as an, like, I guess an outsider, um, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to, to be aware of all the vitriol and Russia phobia and, and stereotypes of what Russians are. And then to see how like genuinely good people are in Russia. And like, I, I just can't wrap my head around how, how people uh, could actually believe these stereotypes about Russians, because mm -hmm. like I've had so many positive, of course there, there's bad people everywhere, but in my experience, I've had so many positive experiences with Russians. Um, it's, it's yeah, that, that part is really heartbreaking. I mean, even for example, uh, when I came here a, a couple months ago, um, my neighbors learned I was coming here and they actually, they did this time, I have a bag right with me. They, uh, they put together a suitcase of aid to take with me, like basic uh. medicine. And I, I have another suitcase and it's full of like diapers and, and child medicine and, and whatever uh, stuff for kids. Um, and th they were like their hearts breaking for the people of the Dundas. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, to be honest, what I've heard from, of course, this is just from people I've met, their heart's breaking for everybody. They're, they're empathetic with Ukraine. They don't want people. And this is, I, I'm making this point because we see the, um, the vitriol coming from uh, Ukrainian nationalists, people who think Russians are subhumans, you know, or orcs mm -hmm. or all these horrible uh, terms they have uh, for Russians. Uh, but I'm not seeing that in Russia. I'm seeing, okay, people want to end the bloodshed and all that, right. but I've, 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 I've seen a lot of empathy in Russia for people of Ukraine. Uh, and, and I don't mean um, uh, regarding like the way the West is depicting what's happening, but right. in general, and the fact that they're living in this horrible uh, system and corrupt state and now facing this operation to <laughs> eradicate the Nazism that is very real and very vivid there. But uh, back to what you're, you're saying, sorry. Um, so uh, the, how people are being affected, I mean, uh, I mean, they've been dealing with Russia phobia for years. Uh, on the other hand, I've, I've, I've had people say like, well, no, I've got friends in the West and they're saying it's not so bad, like that, you know, they're, 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 uh, they, they don't hate us. But then I, I meet other people who say like, yeah, we don't talk with our friends anymore because they, they don't want to talk with us. I don't know. Um, but the situation in Russia itself, like uh, the food prices have gone up a little bit, but not compared to what I've been hearing from the West. Right. And right. generally it feels pretty normal. I've, I'm sorry, you had some other elements to your question. That I think I've forgotten. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, I had talked about the fact that there was um, an RT journalist who was sanctioned, Brian yeah. McDonald, but also other <laughs> journalists um, from, okay. in fact, they're no, no longer, some of them are not even working for RT any longer, but they have Russian state affiliated underneath their um, names, their personal Twitter accounts, like George yeah. Galloway you know, Caleb Maupin, uh, Maupin, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Rachel Blevins, who, you know, who she may still be working for too, but some of them aren't. They're no like, like George is not, he's doing his own thing. And, um, and also he had four decades of being, uh, as you know, well-known, you know, political figure and, and, and so on and so forth. So what, what is your thought on that, on journalists just being targeted this way? Um, yeah, well, like I said earlier, when I was mentioning the uh, Canadian state funded CBC, you know, they don't have Canadian state funded under their um, <clears throat> Twitter handle. And right. none of these, none of these organizations do, but they should, they should very much should, because mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, uh, now I know I write op-eds for RT, <clears throat> which I've done since 2013, uh, but I always like RT has allowed me to write what I want and what I think. And as we just discussed earlier, Tara, I could not do that for any Canadian media. I would be censored like crazy. Uh, and 
it's just, it's, it's pretty crazy that RT gets, or Russian media, not just RT, but Sputnik and Russian media, get all the heat and get all the labels. But in my opinion, I mean, I don't agree fully with everything any media publishes, but they're more honest than Western media uh, in, in what's going on here. And yet they're they're targeted with this label. And then uh, it's it's absolutely ridiculous that in, independent or individual journalists within that are affiliated with RT are targeted with the label, <laughs> especially if they've uh, discontinued their work with RT. But even if they are still working with with RT or Sputnik or whatever media, uh, it's it's absolutely like what would what would America do if journalists for the New York Times were targeted? Because right. I mean, my God, that is one of the most uh, ridiculous and absurd uh, conveyors of propaganda in New York Times or the BBC or the Guardian. The Guardian is among the worst. Now imagine uh, all the individual journalists that write for the Guardian in any capacity, food blogger, whatever, are mm -hmm. sanctioned. You know, then they would yep. say like they would they would raise the alarm. So it's 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 another yep. example of Western double standards and hypocrisy. Uh, everything they can they can apply any sort of uh, sanctimonious standard to Syria, to Russia, to any targeted nation, and it's fine for them. But of course, it would be unacceptable. And actually, if we come back to the current situation. Russia, uh, before beginning the military operation, Vladimir Putin spoke of the many reasons for the military operation, one of which was NATO's continued expansion eastward, another of which was uh, a, a, ten, a tangible uh, intelligence that uh, Ukraine intended to attack full scale the Donbass, which, by the way, if you read the postal, um, Jacques Baud, uh, former Swiss intelligence, he also corroborates that, you know, he's he's not a Russian bot or what have you, he's former Swiss intelligence. And he also corroborates the fact that there was reasonable intelligence that Ukraine intended to attack. Um, but anyway, the point being, uh, uh, in terms of double standards, what would America have done if uh, Russia or any other country was encroaching on America and surrounding America and, and putting military bases in Mexico or Canada or wherever? You know, it's like, it, it's always this consistent double standards. Uh, America has um, um, America is occupying land in Syria mm -hmm. and has destroyed uh, swaths of Syria and is stealing Syrian oil, burning Syrian wheat, and that these these hypocrites uh, in suits dare to claim that Russia is causing a famine in Ukraine when it's Ukraine has mined its own ports, preventing ships from leaving. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm just going on about double standards, but it's endless. No, no, so I mean, we'll it's good. that's why you're on to educate the audience. Yeah, definitely. When we, when we go back to the topic of independent or individual, sorry, uh, journalists, mm -hmm. whether they're working with RT or other media being sanctioned, it's, it's ridiculous because again, were you to apply the same standards to Western prostitutes, there would be outrage. You know, I, and I want to take this um, because I know you, you mentioned you have to leave in just a few minutes. So while for the remaining time you're here, could you talk a little bit about you've heard that the U.S. is sending $40 billion worth of weapons um, to Ukraine um, that hasn't arrived yet. They've already been given like another 800 million just I think was released of weapons last week or the week before. So this will have an impact. Where where are we with this conflict? Because you're on the ground and what? how do you see it unfolding from your opinion? And I know this is your opinion. So it's, it's you know, I mean, it's fluid and it could change, but what what is your thoughts? Are we headed towards, because this is most of us now that talk about this, that have some education and knowledge about it, realize that this is a NATO American mm -hmm. um, proxy war against Russia using Ukrainians as basically cannon fodder. So what, uh, are we headed towards a global conflict? Do you see any kind of peaceful dis diplomatic inroads being made anywhere? Is there anything in sight? Well, as for, um... <clears throat> peaceful or uh, diplomatic inroads like as as Russia has over the past eight years Russia has been consistently pushing for diplomatic talks for for uh, means to end uh, conflict and uh, like the the past eight years while Ukraine was relentlessly shelling the Donbass republics 
Russia kept uh, saying, let's come to the table, let's uh, let's adhere to Minsk, you know, the two Minsk Accords, and Ukraine didn't. And none of the parties that co-signed those accords uh, pressured Ukraine to adhere to them. So Ukraine continued to bomb the Donbass, as you mentioned earlier, 14,000 uh, 14, killed. And, and when I came here in March, um, I reached out to uh, representatives of the two republics. And at that time in March, it was of the 14,000 killed, um, I think it was like, yeah, it was uh, 6,000 in the Donetsk People's Republic and 2,000 roughly, um, roughly in uh, Lugansk People's Republic. So 8,000 amongst the 14. Now it's much more because uh, there's been an intensified Ukrainian shelling campaign, including um, since I arrived and prior to arriving. So, uh, you know, the past eight years, Russia has um, insisted on diplomatic efforts and the West has not uh, agreed and Ukraine has not agreed. And even now, uh, while it conducts the military operation to uh, demilitarize and uh, denazify Ukraine, Russia still wants to come to the table with Ukraine and, and find a, a means to a peaceful solution. And Ukraine and its Western uh, puppet string pullers are not allowing that to happen. So that that that's one thing. As for the weapons, um, I would recommend people listen to people like um, Brian Berlitik, who is a former US Marine, I believe, based in Thailand, has an excellent knowledge of all things uh, military and weapons. And I, I listened to him and, and to like to summarize what he would say if I, and I hope I don't get this wrong, but effectively like what they're sending to Ukraine, it's a lot of money, but the people that are receiving it um, uh, don't, aren't getting the adequate training to use it. So, you know, they're, they're putting the, the soldiers uh, or the recruits or the volunteers whatever um at risk themselves because they don't know how to use these weapons for the most part mm. this is what i understand and at the same time uh you know there's more risk of other people being injured because of misfiring or whatever there's that um and then for those that do know how to use them i mean even last night i was trying to work on some of my footage and i was hearing a lot of bombing just outside the window uh and like i don't know where it was but it was coming from the west so i have to assume it's coming from ukraine and uh, the day one, when I arrived here on Friday, um, maybe an hour before I arrived, uh, down the street, like 15 minutes walk down the street, Ukraine had bombed an area. And, uh, you know, I could see the damage from the to the apartment building. And like all over the Donbass, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, Gorlovka, north of here, is being shelled heavily. And mm -hmm. even a friend who is very accustomed to the shelling said it was hell yesterday. So, mm. you know, the weapons that do reach the Ukrainian forces, it's going to mean that more people in the Donbass are being killed and shelled. And by the way, all these areas they're shelling, they're not military areas. They're they're completely uh, civilian and residential. Uh, so there's no so target. So the except. Ukrainian military is specifically targeting civilian Absolutely, areas. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. When I was here in uh, April, uh, they were shelling the western area of Donetsk. So that was closer to their, their line. And I remember I went to a market uh, that had been shelled around noon and five people were killed and there were still bodies laying in the market when I went there. Now they're heavily shelling Donetsk proper. In fact, I was talking to somebody yesterday. He was saying like, yeah, we were outside 50 meters from where I am now and the shelling started. They were at some restaurant. Uh, so it, it's like, this is where I am right now is a civilian residential area, commercial civilian residential. So yeah, it's deliberate. Uh, and uh, the other thing I would say is like, um, we're seeing a repeat not only of um, the, the propaganda that we've heard on Syria over the years, you know, uh, everything mm -hmm. demonizing Syria and Russia, but also um, the strategies that terrorists in Syria employed, which is to occupy civilian infrastructure, be it schools, hospitals, or residential buildings. And, you know, when Mariupol was being liberated, there was a lot of talk from Western media about destruction, but there's no talk about why there was destruction. And that reason was, and now there have been countless testimonies, again, people like Patrick Lancaster, various yes. Russian media that were, uh, Murad Gazdiev of RT, and various journalists that were on the ground uh, taking testimonies. And, and, and I've heard it myself uh, from residents and from uh, people in the People's uh, uh, Army here, is that uh, Ukrainian forces occupied these residential buildings. So they would fire from them and fire would be returned to them. But on the other hand, conversely, uh, that's been one of the reasons people are always saying like, why is the advance so slow? It's, uh, I mean, it's 
on the one hand, it hasn't been slow because I think over 90% of the Lugansk People's Republic uh, has been restored to stability. But on the other hand, people ask like, well, you know, they're still bombing uh, Donetsk and other cities. Why, why, can't, why can't you take them out? And my understanding is they're, well, again, referring to Brian Berlitek, they've had eight years to deeply entrench themselves and fortify themselves, right. but also this aspect of them firing from areas where there are civilians. So, you know, mm. the, the respective forces here, Russian and Donbass forces, are hesitant to return fire all the time because they, do, they want to minimize uh, civilian casualties. And this is in stark contrast to how the U.S. operates, to how Israel operates, to how Absolutely. Saudi Arabia operates, you know, uh, in Yemen. Uh, mm -hmm. In Israel, as we know, like uh, just demolishes complete entire neighborhoods. Right. Um, just leaves so it that's, in rubble. That's mm -hmm. not what we're seeing yeah. how Russia operates. And that's not what we saw in Syria either. Uh, and people have to realize that um, Russia and Syria uh, were, in, in, with regards to Syria, were waging very strategic operations to eradicate the terrorists. And, and from what I understand, I mean, I'm not seeing it myself because I'm not with the military, but that's how they're operating um, in Ukraine proper as well. And that's why it's taking time. Uh, for peace to be restored here. So yeah, the sending $40 billion of aid, uh, just it's prolonging the suffering. The, the way, if the West actually gave a damn about uh, human lives in Ukraine, they would have uh, stopped all this support to Nazis in Ukraine. They would have stopped uh, fanning the flames of war years ago. And they would have uh, encouraged uh, Zelensky or whoever was in power, you know, to meet with Russia and to, to find, you know, a common ground, but that's not, they, they don't want that. They want, they want, they want to distract people in the U S from, you know, what you're enduring in the U S yeah. like, let's yeah. talk about your healthcare system. Let's talk about your roads. Let's talk about poverty, all the problems that you have in the U S you know, let's distract you from that by fanning up the flames of a war that doesn't need to happen. Absolutely. And I think, you know, too, um, you know, Julian Assange gave his his freedom to bring forth the war crimes of the West, um, you know, evidence of that and receipts of that, including the Medan, you know, coup in 2014. And many Russians, when you ask them, they say this, this, this conflict started in 2014 oh, when absolutely. the Western Baku. I mean, would you agree? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, absolutely. I remember when I came here in 2019 and went to again Gorlovka and, and the regions. Mm -hmm like 500 meters from the Ukrainian forces um, being shelled by the Ukrainians. And I asked them like, you know, um, cause I did interview some of the people uh, in the military. And I said, you know, why, are, why did you take up arms? And most of them were not military before, or like, maybe, okay, the people I met, I don't want to say of the army cause I don't know, but I would say the right. people I met and, and spoke with were not military before. They had various different uh, normal careers. But they said, we saw what happened in Kiev. We saw what we saw the massacre in Odessa. We did not want that to come to us. You know, we saw the rise of this ultranationalism, this Nazism. And they actually asked me, like, what do people in Canada think about um, the fact there are Nazis in Ukraine? And I'm like, right. they don't know. And they don't know there are Nazis in Canada or that Christia Freeland is the descendant of a Nazi collaborator and she's very proud of them. You know, it's not a matter of Christia Freeland, our deputy prime minister, Mm -hmm. uh, having um, a, a skeleton in the closet that she's ashamed of. No, she's proud of her collaborating, her Nazi collaborating grandfather. So anyway, they, they would ask me that. I'm like, yeah, most people don't know because our media doesn't do that work and tell them our media covers it up. And just as they've been covering up the Azov and Idar and other Nazi battalions saying, oh, well, yeah, they don't exist anymore. It's 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 completely disgusting, Tara. Like, again, because with all this, we we get the incessant virtue signaling uh, the, mm -hmm. the pretend uh the, the pretend uh concern for people in this region yeah and, the blue and yellow flags you mean on the social media mm -hmm. yeah and and mm -hmm. just like the, the the script reading uh you know um uh, corporate media prostitutes they they're so concerned about people in ukraine but if they were so concerned they'd be talking about the nazis and like mm -hmm. the fact that ukrainian civilians can be disappeared for having not even having dissenting views, maybe appearing to have dissenting views or speaking Russian. Or I mean, like you said, they... giving a taxi ride. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like what if, what if you're in Canada and just because you spoke French, mm -hmm. that's like a crime against the state and you're disappeared and you're executed. That's what, that's what we're talking about. Oh my that's God. how crazy it is. Yeah. That's, I, I don't think Westerners are really getting what they're supporting. I, I really just don't. 
um, I think they're starting to wake up. I've noticed there's less yellow and blue flags. Um, I'm not sure if that's just the American and Western general, you know, attention just deficit or just, you know, not being able to hold the attention that long, yeah. or if it's actually because they're seeing there's been enough out there where, you know, you've had these pictures of Azov battalion, Nazi symbol symbols, and, and it's kind of made its way into some of the mainstream. So the mm -hmm. answer to that was they, um, they now were trying to do what they call, um, you know, a, a, you know, try to erase the symbols and whatnot and hide yeah. them when they're doing the photographs. So, so that's yeah, just yeah. dishonest, but it's not going to change the ideology that those people are following. It's like when Al Qaeda in Syria rebranded, you know, re -branded. There you go. yeah, they're no longer Al Qaeda in Syria, but they have the same ideology that hasn't changed. So, yeah, exactly. So um, for uh, just on your way out, I know, I know you have to get on the road and do your work and you are, I have just great admiration. And I know many that are listening and watching um, are with you in spirit and surrounding you with you know, safety and, and thoughts of, 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 you know, being able to do your good work. And, um, you, I, I mean, I'm not trying to just say hyper, you are very, very brave to do what you're doing. Just the way you casually said, yeah, there was bombing outside. I was like, God, like, I don't, you know, I'm sitting in my little, you know, Northwestern place where, you know, you might hear a neighbor with a gun, but like, you don't hear <laughs> bombs and things. Right. So you are, I mean, it's, um, you're in the heart of it. You're doing good work and you're trying to raise awareness and, and we are all grateful. And, um, Indy, do you have any final questions or comments from the audience for, for Ava? Before mm, we... Let's see. Uh, let's see. Consider becoming a oh, love your courageous work, Ava. Thank you. Stay safe and give your doggies a hug and pet for me. Of course. That's... <laughs> Oh, I miss them. <laughs> Bingo, eat me, baby. Uh, okay. Well, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin are making a fortune on this proxy war. Of course, Ghost is saying that. Yeah. He's had a lot of fantastic say. Well, I, I say he. They, they've had fantastic stuff to say. And then, of course, facetiously, thank God the Democrats are protecting us from Russian Facebook ads. It's turned out really great. Thumbs up. That's, that's pretty funny. Um, so Ava, how can our audience find you and support your work? Like what are some important things, what are ways that they can help you and, and with all the important work you're doing? Oh, well, uh, thank you for asking that. Um, I have my telegram channel, uh, reality mm -hmm. theories, Eva K Bartlett. Uh, I'm active on social media, but you know, we all have a, we don't know how long we'll all be on Twitter or any of the other yes, stuff. Um, do I know. Do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I have my blog in gaza.wordpress.com and there is uh, a PayPal there, but again, PayPal is a limited uh, thing as well. So I need to change that. So, but yeah, I mean, just, just sharing um, and maybe like, you know, fighting against the whole Russian propaganda thing that that in itself like aside from any sort of financial support just fighting fighting the propaganda is like it would be <laughs> a really huge thing <laughs> yeah and, right. and then like uh, you know uh, the Brandy the NBC hack she got demolished on Twitter because of yeah. people like your listeners you know like people got on Twitter and there's no way I mean, she could in her delusional world say, yeah, these are all Eva Bartlett's paid stooges, but you know, these are normal people that were pissed off, critical thinkers that were pissed off and like mm -hmm. totally demolished her and, and showed her to be the corporate owned uh, shill that she is. So that kind of thing, I, I like, I really, I love seeing that. So yeah, that, that's what people can do. It's just more of that stuff, like just showing that, you know, you can't possibly paint the entire internet as Russian, Russian stooges. You can try, but no, nope. like they can't keep silencing all of us that are yeah. trying to, you know, speak the truth. And, yeah. you know, we have your link tree in our, you know, I believe uh, it's in the YouTube and, and whatever. So people have ways to, to, and what I would encourage is people get on the um, social media and follow Ava's work, follow her. Um, she's doing real time work and videos will be posting soon of her most recent things. And um, we'll uh, try to raise it up as much as we can. And also please like, and subscribe um, this YouTube channel and support independent news network as well. And thank you to Indy uh, for helping us um, late this evening on East coast time and early in the morning, York time, Ava. Um, so Ava, I just, again, want to reiterate, I think I, you're, I want to be you when I grow up, you're just amazing. And, um, <laughs> except that you're younger than me. Um, so, but, but thank you for all the work that you do and just keep 
um, just know that you have people around you that care and that are, Thank can, you. that need, that want to know what's really happening and not have it filtered through a Western lens. So, so thank there you, you so have much. it. There you have it. So thank right, that's, you. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. All right. Be safe. Godspeed. Thank okay. You. Take yeah. care. Bye. Right, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.